that you've given now, plus a panel you did, about staying motivated. Who has trouble with the inspiration and the motivation to keep doing this? Yes. And so I'm sure he's going to talk to you a little bit about this, but throw him some of the obstacles. And we talked about obstacles the other day, but this is different. How do you get that inner power, the inner will to want to do this? So Dr. Ken Berry, give him a warm welcome. Hey, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Who doesn't have a copy? I don't. Yet? I don't. It has my um, keto haiku that I wrote. In oh, you got to read it. Okay. Let's hear it. All right. I don't have to read it. I've written it enough, but okay. <laughs> you guys know what a haiku is, right? Yeah. Well, okay. So bacon, cheese, butter. And don't forget the veggies, but oh man, bacon. bacon. <laughs> okay, so we're talking about how to stay motivated this morning, right? Honestly, raise your hand if you've had trouble with this along your journey of staying motivated. Good, okay, good, good. So I don't have any secrets that you guys don't have access to, but I think a lot of times, at least in my experience in my life, when I was a younger man, you could tell me something and I'd be like, yeah, yeah, whatever, okay, blah, 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 whatever, right? But then as you get older, you start to, you, you listen and you rehear things and you hear it with fresh ears, don't you? You're like, oh yeah, that's a, that's a good idea actually. So try to, hear, try to have fresh ears this morning. Try to hear this for the very first time this morning. And I think that'll help you uh, make these permanent strategies in your journey. Because we're all on this journey together, right? right? I mean, back in 2003, I was a fat, miserable, pre-diabetic doctor who was going into my patient's rooms and saying, hey, you're pre-diabetic. You need to meet, eat the American Diabetic Association diet. That's what you need to do. I, I literally told patients that back in 03, 04. I, I was ignorant. I didn't know better. And now I do know better, and I'm trying to right those wrongs. That's what I'm trying to do, and I'm trying to turn the tide on the diabetes epidemic in the United States and in the world. Yes, ma'am. I was almost 300 pounds. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm a tall guy, so I uh, hope that I carried it pretty well. But no, no, yeah. And so one morning I was tying my shoes before clinic and, and literally got short of breath with my foot up in the chair tying my shoes. And I was like, you know what? This is stupid. You're, I'm, suppo I'm a doctor. I'm supposed to be the guy that is the expert on the care and feeding of a human being. And my human body sucks. I got dandruff, I got heartburn, I got acne, I got just chronic pain. You know, I get up in the morning, I'm like an old man. What the heck? Who am I? What am I doing here? And uh, I'll just tell you quickly, my, in my family, the favorite parable to tell is the parable of the preacher who got caught in the bar. You guys know this story? <laughs> Somebody, yeah, you know this story, Lauren? Okay, so the preacher, well, you know, every Sunday he got up and he was firing brimstone. You do this, you don't do that. This is how you live. This is what you do. And so one Saturday night, uh, one of the parishioners, for whatever reason, was in the bar and caught the preacher sitting on a bar stool with a beer with a, with a, a lady of the evening sitting beside him. And he said, preacher, what are you doing? You've told us time and time again this, 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 and this. And here you are, smoking a cigarette, drinking a beer. I don't even know how you know this woman. What's going on? And, and the preacher said, you do as I say, not as I do. Yeah. <laughs> and so I, from a very young age, that was the parable of how you don't live your life. Mm -hmm. And so I was not going to be that fat miserable, sick doctor taking a fistful of pills every day and then advising you on your health. Mm -hmm. I, couldn't, I couldn't do that. That just was um, incongruous with the way I wanted to live my life. And so that's why I'm here today. That's one of the reasons. Okay? So let's talk about how to stay motivated. And you guys have probably picked up one of the underlying themes of, of what I do is that the ketogenic way of eating is the natural diet that human beings should eat. It's the diet that we, we prospered and evolved on for hundreds of thousands of years. And so I want you to understand that the human body is not 
It's a sick body. The human body is not an obese body. The human body, there's nothing about you that's, there's nothing wrong with you, okay? What's wrong is that you've slowly poisoned your body for all these years. How can you expect a healthy body if that's what you've been doing to your body, right? And so now we're all in the process of unpoisoning, of removing the poison. So the first thing is I want you to expect health. Expect it. That's, that's what you gotta do. That's how you have to think about this. The human body, by definition, is healthy, is active, feels good, is not stiff, is not painful. That's, that, those are not natural things, even though we've all maybe had that for a few years, and we've all come to expect that, and we've all been taught, oh yeah, after 40, oh yeah, dude, it's, you're done. <laughs> after 50, oh, you're really done, right, Lauren? After 50, it's over. Yeah. Right, yeah, you could look at Lauren and tell that there's just no life after that. And so that's number one. First and foremost is expect health and give your body what it needs to achieve that health, but more importantly, stop poisoning your body. Some poisons are very fast, like strychnine and arsenic and cyanide. They'll get you, right? Other poisons are very, very slow, and they take years or even decades to end your life, but they make you miserable along the way. Sugar's one of those, right? Grains, grains that's one of those. Vegetable oils are one of those slow poisons that you can eat it and be like, eh, it didn't really hurt me, I didn't die. But that's a slow poison, and so when you expect health, then you stop doing things that are gonna not give you what your expectation is, which is health. I expect to be healthy. There's no reason I shouldn't be healthy. My DNA has been on this planet for a million years. Are you telling me that it's so defective that I can't be healthy? No, no, your DNA has basically been perfected in the fire of evolution over all these millennia. You, you deserve to be healthy, and you should expect it. That's first and foremost is your mindset. That's very important. Secondly, I want you, I like it when you guys mess up. I like it, okay? Can you guess, Joe, why I like it when you mess up? When you go off plan and eat something stupid? Why do I like that? No, uh, not because you come see me. No, no, because you get that when you're keto for a while and you've re removed so much inflammation, when you eat something stupid, what does your body let you know immediately? That's stupid. 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 That was stupid. Yeah. And so it's it's a it's a good feedback mechanism. And so people will message me like, oh man, I messed up and I feel terrible. I'm like, good. Stop doing it. Right. Exactly. That's your body saying, hey dummy, don't do that. I don't like that. It's not good for me and it's not good for you. So if you don't don't even sweat messing up because it's actually a good thing because you get immediate feedback. Oh, that's dumb, I'm not doing that again, right? Just like when Nisha and I went to London, we thought, man, I'm, gonna, I'm about to have some Guinness and some chips and some meat pies and we, we ruined our trip to London. And so we will never do that again. Our body gave us immediate feedback and we were like, oh, okay, gotcha, yeah. So then the next, and that leads directly to my next point is, is that when there's something in your way, an obstacle's in your path, that's, it's, it's one of two things, and either way you're right, okay? It's either a stumbling block, a stumbling block, or it's a stepping stone, mm -hmm. but it's both, mm -hmm. okay? It's both, it's, it's your perception. And so everything that gets in your path, and when I was a younger man, this was not my strategy, everything was a stumbling block, right? Oh man, now I can't do this, now I can't do that. But no, now everything that happens to me, no matter how adverse, I'm like, now how can I use this? How can I, how's this gonna make me better? How's this gonna make me stronger, right? And so a lot of this is perception. You guys have to look at those obstacles. Those are stepping stones. That just lets you get up on them and see, see further down the, the road. That's what that is. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. And so don't be afraid to mess up. And I'm not advocating mess ups. But when you mess up, learn from it. And then add that to your wisdom. Because if you've got a gray hair or two, that means you're supposed to have some wisdom. That's what those mean, right? <laughs> So, yeah. And then I talked about this the other day. Control what you can. If you can control something, control it. If you can't, then you've got to learn a strategy that works for you to let it go. Right? Because if you're, if you're focusing and agonizing over stuff you can't change, you're wasting all your energy. You're wasting all your energy and you're not helping yourself 
and you're not helping your family. You only help your family by fixing the things you can fix and letting, it, letting the rest go. You have to do that, and that's part of having a successful life and a successful way of eating. Don't focus on weight. How many, how many focus too much? Be honest, now's your moment of honesty. You focus too much on the damn scales, yeah. right? If you know anybody about to start the ketogenic way of eating, I would encourage you to have them check some baseline lab work, right? Measure yourself like you're getting measured for a suit of clothes or a dress. And it's okay to weigh. I think it's okay, but, but most people don't need to weigh any more often than once a week, especially women, right? Because you guys got that fluid hormonal thing, and there's nothing more frustrating when you've done a good two days of, of your diet and you get on the scale and you gain two pounds. And that's not fat. There's no way you gain two pounds of fat in two days. But that's what it feels like. And that's, that's very unmotivating. And so weigh once a week, no more often. And some people, I've, I've had a couple people tell me that their spouse had to hide the scale, had to, had to put it out in the garage and then bring it in every Sunday or once a month or whatever. If you have to do a strategy like that, I think that's perfectly fine to do that. But weighing every day, does it help you at all? So it doesn't help you. So do you see how we're right back to the previous point? You're, you're obsessing about something that's not helping you. So why are you doing that? Stop that. Figure out a strategy that works for your life to stop doing that, okay? Weigh once a week, that's fine. Check your measurements because very often the scale will say, nope, you haven't made any progress at all, but you've lost two inches from your measurements. That's a victory, that's a huge deal. Maybe your measurements haven't changed, but your A1Cs went down three tenths of a point. It's a huge victory, okay? In my eyes, that's a bigger victory than the scale moving. And so I want you to measure and track lots of things. I want you to check your blood sugar. That's a huge victory if you wake up with a great morning blood sugar or two hours after a meal, your blood sugar's great. I don't care what the scale says. If your blood sugar's good, you're gonna get there eventually. Right, Lauren? Sometimes it seems like it's, a, it's never gonna happen, but if you keep doing the right things and measuring properly, you're gonna be very happy you did ultimately, okay? I want you to learn why. That's very important. If, if Joe says, hey, you need to eat keto, blah, blah, and you're like, okay, and you just start doing it because Joe said so, that's a recipe for, for failure. You're gonna quit, you're gonna stop. But if you keep learning, if you keep watching YouTube videos, if you keep reading blogs and listening to podcasts and learn the why, 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 why fat? Why this much protein, not that much? Why are carbs so bad? Why, what about grains? Exactly why, why? Because somebody's gonna ask you, and if you don't know, you're gonna be like, I don't know. And then you're gonna be like, well, gosh, I don't even really have any foundation that I'm standing on here. I'm just, it's just an opinion. You wanna you want know, you wanna know the facts. Uh, the facts will take you home, okay? There's a, a new podcast, Joe Rogan, uh, a, uh, Dr. Kahn and, Dr. and Chris Kresser had a debate, three hours long, and Kresser knew his facts. He knew the why, and he mopped the floor with Dr. Kahn, okay? Who's a who's a, 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 big, a, a vegetable, you know, vegetable vegan cardiologist who says that cholesterol is bad for you and saturated fat is the devil. And Kresser mopped the floor with him because he knew the why. You gotta know your why. That's gonna keep you motivated, but it's also gonna help you wake up other people and motivate them. And motivating other people, as you might be discovering, is also very motivating for you, isn't it? Isn't it? Yeah. yeah, exactly. Okay, and so next you're gonna build a team. This can be your mama, this can be your spouse, this can be your next door neighbor, it can be Jimmy Moore, it can be me. You get to build your own team, okay? But this is not a journey you wanna take on your own for two reasons. First of all, you don't get as much out of it if you're by yourself. And secondly, you get to help other people. And, and actually you get to be a motivator and you get to be a stepping stone for other people instead of a stumbling block, right? Because nobody likes somebody who's preachy and who's judgmental, nobody likes that, nobody wants that. But if you're helping other people, you're also helping yourself. So build that team, okay? Because one of the beautiful things about having a team is you get to hear their success stories as well, don't you? Now I love Lauren's story, this is a beautiful story, or what? But there's, there's all kinds of success stories in here. Let's hear one, who wants to, Linda? Stand up. I want to know where you came from to where you are now. You guys listen to this. It's pretty cool. I grew up in Texas. I 
Give her the mic. Um, I was 85 pounds heavier and I was actually on a cruise and a couple at my dining table were on keto and had showed before and after pictures and told me about their health and they were very lovingly shared what he just said, you know, to, to, to be a team and they helped me start on it right then on that cruise. Um, I have systemic lupus and I also have um, um, Epstein-Barr and I was so tired all the time, you know, your joints all hurt. and. Um, I had thyroid cancer. I just, just felt miserable, but I feel good. And yesterday, I had an on-scale victory. I, I went on the zip line. I would have, as a heavy person, I would have never ever, oh, I'm still heavy, but I mean, I'm a healthy person now. And I would have never been considered that. Well, oh, <laughs> um, but anyway. That's the team. Do you have a team? Yeah, that's my, that's my team. That's team. That's team. Um, but it's, it's changed my outlook. You know, I get to be a fun Nana instead of a out of shape mama that I was for my babies. So that's my story. Like a the older I get, the more I think that being a, a fun, active grandparent, that's probably a pretty cool thing to be. It is, it's uh, is it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Instead of the grandparent the kids have to go to the nursing home to see yes. because you've had the stroke mm -hmm. and you've yeah, yeah, so I love that, that's awesome. All right, so, and then we celebrate victories. That's the ultimate way you stay motivated is by hearing these victories from your teammates, right? And when you hear that, that's very motivating to you. You might be a little envious. You might be like, well, I want, I want a story that good. Well, okay, keep, do, keep going down the road. It's down there, I promise, because it sure ain't the other way. It's not back there where you came from, is it? That's not where it is. It's down the road, this journey we're all taking together. And so celebrate each other's victories and don't be shy about your victories. You guys got to share those with other people. And sharing in a loving, open way, like the couple shared with Linda, that's how you do it. That's how you do it. You lead by quiet example. And then when somebody asks, you're happy to help them out, right? So you're saying, Linda, you didn't hear about this from the American Diabetes Association? It's not. Lauren, you, you heard about it from the American Heart Association, is that right? Yeah. So you see, guys, we got nobody at the top that's going to help. I forgot to say, now I get to educate my endocrinologist. Yeah. Yeah. Another non-scale victory is getting to teach your doctor how to be a good doctor. Yeah, absolutely. Because there are a lot of docs are primed and ready because they know keto is getting big. They know that's happening. But they don't really understand it, and none of their peers are talking about it in any positive way. I can just tell you that at the medical board meetings and the, the medical society meetings, nobody's saying, dude, you should look into keto. It's a big deal. They're not saying that, right? If anything, it's negative. And so you got these doctors are like mountain lions out in the wilderness. We get on our little mountain and we, we want everybody to leave us alone. Let us do what we do. And so that's good in that you're, you're an individual and you're taking, taking charge and taking leadership, but it's bad because you don't have any sounding boards very often to bounce ideas off anybody. And you imagine another doctor saying, hey doc, what do you think about keto? That's probably not gonna go well. You're gonna, I mean, he could even be judged by, you know, what the hell's wrong with you? Keto, what do you, what, did you fall and hit your head? Okay, and so when the, when the first patient, when the first Linda goes to her endocrinologist and says, you know, keto's really gave me all these victories, the first Linda, he's gonna judge her as a kook. Isn't he? She's nuts, whatever, right? But what about when the 10th Linda tells him about the benefits of keto. Mm -hmm. What about when the hundredth Linda tells him about the benefits of keto, he's gonna be like, oh, I gotta Google keto, what is this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who's this Maria Emery, who, what, who, what is this, right? Who's Jimmy Moore? It's like, who is John Galt? And so, <laughs> where's Waldo? <laughs> where's Waldo, yeah, maybe. But that's what I'm telling you, you wanna be that hundredth Linda to ask your doctor, what? Keto, look what it's done for me. Because at some point, all doctors used to be very intelligent, inquisitive, curious students. We had to be to become doctors, right? I talk about that in the book. You can't go to med school if you're lazy and, and bored with everything and everything. You can't, you'll fail immediately. You have to be eager to learn and you have to be a student and curious. There's that, that little young doctor still in your doctor somewhere, way down in there, right? But when the hundredth person, the hundredth Linda says, man, keto saved my life, 
you're going to awaken that curiosity and he's going to Google it and he's going to look and he's going to watch some YouTube videos and then he's going to be on board. And then you just help not just one person, Linda, you helped every patient he has, didn't you? How powerful is that? That's right. Yes, ma'am. I wonder how many, doc, how many patients that endocrinologist cares for? Hundreds. And you have had a direct impact on all those hundreds of people's lives. Huh? That's pretty cool, right? That's pretty awesome. Any questions, guys? Yes, ma'am. So how long have you been keto, and what, 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 what inspired you, you know, to, to change your ways? So I was, I was fat, miserable, pre-diabetic, uh, about to have to start metformin, about to have to start a statin because back then in, in 03 I believed in them and uh, and I said I can't do that I can't and so my journey is a lot a lot like a lot of people in keto I started out with paleo primal because I was like that's real food right that makes sense yeah so I did that and I got some benefits out of that but after a certain point the benefits that was, that was I was maxed out with paleo primal and so then I said well and, and in my opinion the ketogenic way of eating is a subset of paleo and why all the paleo people have such trouble with keto I have no idea because it's just a subset of paleo I believe probably a hundred thousand years ago if you lived right at the equator on one on this island here that we were just at you probably ate paleo most of the year because there's always some mango or some guava or some whatever right and so I think a large percentage of our, our ancestors ate paleo I, I still believe that but I think that also a large population of our ancestors lived in the very northern climates, right? In Scandinavia, in Scotland, in Ireland, uh, and or in the very southern where it's cold. You only have one month out of the year where green stuff grows, or two months out of the year. They didn't eat paleo for 10 months out of the year. What did they eat? Carnivore meat. They, they, they eat keto. And I believe that carnivore is a subset of keto. That, I, that makes perfect sense, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so when you're eating essentially zero carbs, you don't have to worry about the protein as much because you're not going to get the gluconeogenesis if you're eating super low carbs. Mm -hmm. And so within paleo is keto, and within keto is carnivore. And carnivore may not be for you, and that's okay, but keto is. I can guarantee you that, right? And so any other questions, guys? Yes, sir, Lauren. I'm in on the, on the doctor business. I said that my is referring patients. As a matter of fact, Dr. Nally told me he came over after making an appointment one evening. They spent three hours going through the diet and whatnot, the what, how. On the other hand, my oncologist, I'm the number one guy who's talked to her, and she does not want to hear it. Mm -hmm. I put it out there. She's happy about my weight loss, and we've agreed not to talk about it. And don't, don't ruin a relationship with a good doctor by insisting on the keto. Yeah. Definitely bring it yeah. up. Yeah, bring it up. Don't be preachy. But if you're not the hundredth Lauren, you're not gonna you're not gonna flip that doctor. Right? If you're the first Lauren or the tenth Lauren, they're gonna just be like, ah, I keep hearing about this keto crap. What is this? But if but and so you're not the hundredth Lauren in that situation, but somebody's gonna be, right? But you still played your part. And when the hundredth Lauren comes along for that oncologist, they're gonna be like, oh, I've had it with this, I'm gonna look this keto crap up. I don't know what's going on. Yeah, it's beautiful. But operating under a, a false paradigm, that's what doctors, most doctors are doing these days, right? Just like back when the world was flat. We, none of us remember that because we all grew up under the paradigm, the world's round. So it makes perfect sense to us. But can you put yourself back in time and think if, if you're just a, a peasant, right? 2,000 years ago, you were like, yeah, but duh, the world's flat, of course. It, I mean, it says it in scripture. It look at it; it's flat. You throw things up; it comes down. It, it wouldn't if you were. It can't be a ball, right? But you were wrong. But everybody knew that was right. That's a paradigm, right? And so this doctor is still operating under the paradigm of eat lots of whole grains, keep your saturated fat low, 
and that makes sense to him or her right now. But when you've had enough, people come along and say, yeah, that's dumb, doc. I had great benefits doing it this way. That's gonna make that doctor question their paradigm. And when that happens, as, a, as we say, you can't unhear the bell once you've heard the bell ring. And once you've heard the 100th Lauren, their story, you're gonna be like, okay, fine. Let me look this up and see what this is all about. Because obviously, you know, there's not, a, they, all these people aren't nuts. Maybe the first Lauren was nuts, but not the 100th Lauren. There's something going on here. I need to know about this. Yes, ma'am. For most people, 20 grams a day of total carbs is really an ideal place to be. Uh, there are some people who can eat, you know, stay under 50 total grams and do okay, do fine. But if you have certain kinds of metabolisms, if you have insulin resistance, like Jimmy and I do, 50 grams of carbs, I'd be looking for my old fat boy pants in about three months. I'd be having to get those if we still got them. I think they should throw them away. <laughs> but I would be looking for my fat boy pants. I'd have to have those back if I eat that many grams of carbs. So I think it's, it, oh, I, 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 I eat less than five grams a day okay. on a daily basis. Yeah, yeah. And I'm, I'm, I'm 95, 97% carnivore. Basically, I'll have some green stuff as garnish or as um, like a spice. <laughs> or just for a, a savory flavoring. But as far as eating a big plate of veg, I've eaten more vegetables on this trip than I've eaten in a, over a year. Yeah, and, and, and the extent of that is a little broccoli and a little asparagus. For me, that's a lot of veggies. So you're, you recommend to your, your, your patient environment like 20 carbs or less. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and For almost, uh, that's a great place to start. And then if you, if you think you need more, I'm fine. If you want to eat 30 grams total carbs a day, is that still not a victory? Yes. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Am I going to argue with them on that? I'm like, yeah, it's fine. It's great. Yeah. Because they already know. They've heard the bell. And so if 30 don't get it, they're going to tighten up, aren't they? They're going to bring it on in some more. Yeah. I'm slightly confused, too, because when I try to be carnivore, I, I want to put a huge steak on my plate. And I do like veggies. But if I'm going to ignore the veggies, then I eat more protein. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, but now I'm reading that if I eat more protein than my body needs, that turns to carbs or so. Man, yeah, excellent. So, so, and there's a, there, we were taught earlier on in, in this journey, all of us thought that if you eat too many grams of protein, you're going to initiate gluconeogenesis yeah. and make all these extra, this glucose, right? And so if you're still eating uh, 50 or more grams of total carbs a day, you will do that. But Dr. Ben, ben Bickman, Write that down, B-I-K-M-A-N. He has an excellent lecture on a YouTube video about how if you're eating super low carb, the protein is not gonna meaningfully raise your, your okay. insulin or your blood sugar in any, any way, right? And so that's why I tell people, if you're eating zero carb, don't even worry about the protein. Now you wanna try to eat a one-to-one -one fat to protein ratio, not of calories, but of grams, and so, you get a steak you want the fattiest cut you can find right and then you're going to put some butter on top of that probably yeah. and I, I always uh, if I cook them indoors I'll put some bacon grease in the skillet in the oven with the steak and so you want to up the, the good healthy fats as much as you can and you want to try to get to a one, one to one ratio at least that's where I feel best but now if you talk to Dr. Ted Naiman who's a very intelligent guy he disagrees he thinks you should have more protein than fat and I think maybe for some people that's okay. Maybe that works for some people, but for me that does not work because I don't enjoy that diet. I think chicken breast is skinless and boneless as the devil. <laughs> I, I don't miss it at all, okay? I want chicken legs with the skin on. That to me is, that's a lean meat mm -hmm. for me, okay? So I'm a pork chop, ribeye, T-bone, uh, baby back ribs, dry. That's, you know, that's what I live on right now and I do very well on that. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. And so if you're eating higher carbs, then you need to watch your protein count. But if when you get your carb count down very, very low, you don't have to worry about eating too much protein. You agree with that, Maria? Amen. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I think if you just eat too much protein, you're not going to hurt your kidneys, but it's going to make your meal very 
challenging. Has anybody tried to stuff down three or four boneless, dry chicken breasts? Skinless, I mean, that's torture. No, 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 no. Yes, no. I did actually do the high protein. It was terrible, wasn't it? It was horrible. It was horrible. Right. Exactly. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I don't know. I don't. I don't really go by specifics. Just add some butter, and if that's not enough, add some more. Yeah, go to taste. Right, right. And, you're yeah. tidy and then, and then after you eat your your pasture chicken, which is great. I'm glad you're doing that. And pastured eggs, man, that's that's where it's at. But then, if you're still hungry, add more fat. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, there's a ton of them. The, the most important one is your waist to height ratio. And if everybody in this room hasn't measured that, you need to because that's a huge, that, that is the biggest uh, re indicator that you're probably insulin resistant. If it's above 0.5, then you're, you're at least some degree insulin resistant, okay? And then when you go see your doc, get more than just the regular annual blood work. Get an A1C and a C peptide and plus or minus a fasting insulin, and that's gonna tell you without a doubt. Then you don't have to worry about, is that a tag or a mole? You don't have to worry about that because you know what your C-peptide is, and you know what your A1C is, and then you know for a fact. And so the, the physical signs, like skin tags, like acanthosis, nugger cans, like uh, being round in the middle, those things you can use until you get to your doctor, right? But when you check a waist to height ratio and it's above 0.5, you're insulin resistant, the end. Yes. Definitely we don't have time for any more questions. I'm sorry. Save it for the Q&A because we're way oh, okay. off of motivation on your ketogenic diet. We're way off of that. We're going to have a whole time with this man and John Lemansky for this afternoon. So let's save those. All right, guys. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you.